You have been called by the nurse to review a patient who has become progressively confused a few hours after surgery. What would you do in this situation? I have been informed of a patient with post-operative confusion. This patient might be critically unwell, and I would go and assess them immediately. I would also ask the nurse to prepare the drug chart, fluid chart, and operative notes for my arrival, and would kindly request a fresh set of observations. At the bedside, I would first ensure that the patient is stable, and would put out an emergency call if there was any concern of hemodynamic compromise. Otherwise, I would begin my assessment following the CRISP protocol, and would first examine the airway. If the patient is talking, then the airway is patent, and I would move on to assess breathing. I would obtain the patient's respiratory rate and oxygen saturations before palpating, percussing, and auscultating the chest. Depending on my findings, I would consider a chest X-ray and an arterial blood gas at this point. I would also place this patient on 15 litres of high-flow oxygen via a non-rebreather mask. Moving on to circulation, I would first recheck the patient's heart rate, blood pressure and capillary refill time, and would auscultate the heart for any added sounds or murmurs. I would ensure that an ECG is performed on this patient and would proceed to gain intravenous access via two wide ball cannulae in both antecubital fossae. I would obtain a confusion screen to include a full blood count, renal profile, CRP, LFTs, TFTs, bone and coagulation profile. To rule out infective causes of confusion, I would also get a venous lactate with blood cultures and would start the patient on IV fluids and antibiotics as part of the sepsis 6. Finally, I would insert a urinary catheter to closely monitor fluid balance. Once the circulation is stable, I would move on to disability by first assessing the patient's conscious level using the GCS scale and would request a CT head if this is less than 13. I would also ensure that the pupils are equal bilaterally, round and responsive to light and accommodation, specifically looking to exclude pinpoint pupils, which would indicate opioid toxicity. I would also want to measure the patient's glucose level to ensure they are not hypoglycemic. Finally, I would expose the patient whilst maintaining dignity and normothermia and would examine any surgical sites for infection, as well as assess for calf tenderness, PR bleeding, or rashes. I would check the patient's temperature at this stage. If the patient remains stable, I would take a focused history or a collateral history from any family members or nursing staff. I would review the patient's anaesthetic and drug chart for opioid use, the operative notes for potential complications, as well as the news chart for trends. Most of my bedside investigations would already have been requested during the CRISP protocol, but I would consider a CT abdomen pelvis if indicated. I would consider optimizing this patient for theater by keeping them nil by mouth, documenting the last oral intake, taking a group and save, and escalating them to my registrar. Definitive management of this patient would depend on the cause. My top differentials would be opioid toxicity, electrolyte abnormalities, shock from sepsis or an intraoperative bleed, and shortness of breath from basal atelectasis. I would therefore stop any opioid use, start an naloxone infusion, replace electrolytes as appropriate, initiate the sepsis 6, and encourage chest physiotherapy. You suspect that this patient has been given a high dose of opioids. How much naloxone would you give? An initial dose of 400 to 2,000 micrograms of naloxone may be given intravenously and may, if required, be repeated at two to three minute intervals. The diagnosis of opioid toxicity should be reconsidered if there is still failure to respond after a total of 10 milligrams has been administered. What are the potential causes of hyponatremia in a surgical patient? Post-operative hyponatremia has many causes. Primarily, it is provoked by the stress response to surgery, which results in a syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion, often promoting water retention in most patients. Other causes include aggressive postoperative fluid resuscitation with crystalloids containing dextrose, perioperative medication adjustments, and finally, loss of sodium due to diarrhea and vomiting. <laughs>